so that the onion gets in the bottom a little bit. Looks good already. Okay. I'm going to continue cooking it now for another 7-8 oh, minutes. Well, I finished the salad, going back here. Now my zucchini is kind of cured. So what you do, you use those little strips of zucchini. And you know, I can taste one, I know. They are crunchy now and salted. It's very nice. So you, you just do little strips of zucchini around. Add a garnish. You know, you can put them in any old way here. But it's a nice, nice design, like nice shape. Yeah. I have always a lot of zucchini in my garden in summer. And we use zucchini flowers you know, to do fritter with it. And we do all kind of thing with the zucchini. So that goes around. Put that in the center. of my zucchini. That's a really nice, fresh, invigorating salad, you know? Okay. Just bring up parsley there. And this is it. So, I'm gonna go on with our menu and do the first course. Another little timbal that we call timbal, which is something together, you know, of uh, smoked salmon. And that's a very interesting thing that I do for brunch. My wife loves that too. And you'll see how easy it is. I just put some chives there into a little container like this one. You know, this is one portion, it's great. So you put it in the bottom. Then put a little bit of cheese, about the value of one tablespoon. Sometimes I use cream cheese, but this is goat cheese. I put it there. Don't worry about pressing it because what you're going to do, I have smoked salmon here, and what we're going to do is actually take a slice of salmon. You know, you can fold it like that to make it fit. We put it on top and I use the salmon to press it, you know, in place, that's it. Then what goes with the salmon red onion? I can cut that by hand, or if you have a beautiful machine like this, which we call a mandolin, you can use it. There is a guard when it's whole like this. I use my hand going right through, at least to go halfway through, then I would use the guard. And then the same thing with apple. I want to put some apple in there. So here, let me put a piece of apple, a little bit of red onion, I like to put ground paper on top of it here. I mean, you can see that at that point you could put zucchini, you could put all kinds of things in there. So another piece of smoked salmon. I mean, two pieces like that should be a nice portion. That's it. You know, sometimes you do it one way, another time another way. Whether you put this one before that one is not that important either, you know. So here's my onion. Nice piece of apple to finish. A bit more pepper, maybe a dash of salt on there on top of this. And that's it. You can cover that with plastic wrap and put that in your refrigerator. You know, you can see what it looks like. And maybe I put a bit of chives on top too. And that's it. You're ready to serve it. And when you serve it here, what I did, I did a bit of a sauce with cucumber. And the cucumber not going to use all of it, just the end of it, to show you how easy it is. A little piece of cucumber, cut in half. I will take probably the seed out using a, you know, a teaspoon like this to go on one side to the other side. Little dice of this. Actually, I had zucchini before. I could do dice of zucchini as well, and it would work perfectly fine for this. Here I am. 
Okay. Dice of cucumber there. I have capers. Those are nice, small capers. I like the small one better than the big one. They're a bit more refined. A dash of salt, again. Paper, you have to season everything that we do. And olive oil. So this is the base. So you know, unmold it like this and see whether it comes out. You can always slide a knife on the side, you know, and make it up, move it to give a little bit of air. Then it will come out like a nice little pate here. A last little timbal. And we have that other garnish all around. And that makes a very elegant, a very elegant first course, you know. With a little more. A little more shy around like this. Wow. That looks good. Here we are. And I wanted to show you that sometimes with the same ingredient, you know, you can present things in a different way. This is usually what professional chefs do. You know, you take an idea from somewhere, you look at something and you do it in a totally different way. And I like to do that, it's a bit challenging. So our salmon, I serve salmon all the time at home, all the time slightly differently. And here, a beautiful plate again. And see, you smoke salmon, I mean the standard way you buy it cut or you cut it yourself is really to try to place your salmon you know, some people try to do a rose with it, and you can sometimes, if the slices are large enough. But instead of putting it flat, I like to put the salmon this way, in uh, kind of the way it falls, I mean the prosciutto also actually. So I have a bunch of smoked salmon right there, like this way. Red onion, I had red onion before, the red onion is kind of classic here, so I can take a piece of red onion and do it very, very thin, you know, with your knife. To do a kind of julienne with it, you know. And you can shred this a little bit all over. Capers are perfect with smoked salmon. So I have my capers here. I will serve Take the juice out, some of the capers around, you know, this way. Shives in the same way. That I could serve on top and around. This would be more of a classic way of serving smoked salmon. The cucumber, I could use it again in a different way. A little bit like I did the zucchini, I could take my smoked salmon doing strip of cucumber this way. Taking the cucumber together, and you can do spaghetti with it if you want. That is, you can serve it like this, but this way rolling it and doing a type of uh, a type of spaghetti of cucumber, a of salt actually. Oh, let's put it in the center here. We're improving here, that's it. Then I have a little bit of olive oil. Would always serve it slightly around like this. And with this, it would be classic to serve crouton, you know, or bread. And I like to serve it very often this way, you know, in long strip. Or maybe three of those. Now, if you really want to be fancy, then we do a butter roll. If the temperature is, is okay on my butter, and it is here, I scrape it this way. And from that moment, I let it turn around to create like a flower, you redo it again, and that time you do it very tight 
to create the center of your flowers. You cut the piece of it, put that right here, and you have a beautiful rose butter to be served with it. That's at least $25 now. You started at $5, and each time you add something else in the restaurant, you increase your price. And with this, I always put, as I finish, a bit of freshly ground paper, you know. And the freshly ground paper, it's very important, as I said, to ground it like this at the last moment. This is where you smell the essential oil. If you have your paper ground for a month, two months, it burns your mouth, but it doesn't really have any taste at all. So it's important to have freshly ground paper. and brown in the in the center I can see so up to now we have no liquid in it so now we're gonna put tomato about a cup cup and a half of tomato you can use a canned tomato there as well as the fresh one it'd be perfectly fine for this one and uh, and our beans Here, and I have two cans of beans. You can drain it, but you really don't have to. I have to put more liquid in there anyway. And this is the large cannelli beans, you know. I need a bit more water in there. I can use this, rinse it out to finish it up. So the stew is cooking. This has to come to a boil now and simmer gently for for seven, eight, ten minutes, and that's basically it. Serve it in a large, or you serve it in there in a large casserole, a bit of fresh herbs on top. It's a great dish. And now, we're going to do the dessert for our menu. This is one of those desserts that I do when guests arrive unexpectedly. Usually at home, we don't really have dessert, but I always have. I have whipped cream cheese, any type of cream cheese, actually orange, and I always have that at home, so it's one of the desserts that I would do. Take a little bit of the, those, those strip like this to flavor your cream cheese, and we're going to do segment with the orange. So what you do, I use a very thin, long knife, and you want to cut. You can see that those orange have an enormous, I mean the side of that, the side of that skin is enormous are basically going to have nothing left here. And the next time, then it's going to be different and my orange is going to be much larger. But you can see that this one here is not a good deal at the market, I tell you. I mean, you buy that orange and you see the side of that orange and you're left with this. It's not even a quarter of the, the original weight. So that happened. So let's do at least two orange like this. You see that, the sticker I cut could do the same dessert with the uh, grapefruit. So we want to remove the segment here. And those segments, you will go between two membranes here, and you have one, and then the next membrane, you go next to the membrane, twist your knife around, and you'll see that your, kni your uh, knife will come back up to next to that membrane, and again, that's it. So you get used to that. Sometimes the membrane is very thin. Sometimes they are large. The idea is to have nice segment of orange without, uh, without the membrane, you know. So what I have here, I will use the juice so you don't lose anything. Okay, so this, we have the cream cheese now with the rind of the orange. We want to put sugar in there and work this out with a spatula. If it's a, if it's a whipped cream cheese, then it's relatively soft, you know. So the flavor is only the cream cheese, 
sugar rind of orange. With this, all you want to do is to serve that directly in your plate here. You know, like this. And then we want to garnish that with orange. A little bit all over the plate, there is not really any rule on this. You want to give like maybe one orange for each of your guests. That should be plenty here. And we create a sauce. The sauce is usually created with the juice of the orange and a little bit of orange marmalade here. So we concentrate the same taste in a sense. You mix it together. Somehow I don't know why I think of that as a British dessert. I don't know why, but mix that in there. Sometimes I put pomegranate seed on top of it, which is beautiful if you don't have that. You know, maybe a couple of, uh, couple of blueberry will work fine here. And that end up being a very sophisticated dessert. A couple of cookies with that. Fast, easy dessert. I'm always in the mood for that type of dish, you know? With ham, with sausage, I love sausage. And then you can cut a nice piece of ham like this. You know? And then your sausage. I mean, look at that, the mushroom. That's it. Here we are. Maybe a bit more juice. A bit of parsley on top. And with this, a deep, heavy, robust wine from the south of France. Make my dishes for your loved one. Sharing makes the food taste so much better. Happy cooking. A KQED television production. This is one of my favorite snack with drink, and it's very easy to do. All you do is to put a slice of tomato, a bit of salt on it, some cheese, I like Gruyere cheese, and on top of that, pepper flake, dash of oil, 10 minutes in the oven, they are perfect. I'm Jacques Pepin, this is Fast Food My Way. I'm going to do a great soup and very easy soup today, starting with scallion, onion, corn, and hominy. So the first thing that I do is to put oil in that sturdy Dutch oven there, and you start with the scallion, put a little bit of chopped onion. Can be chopped coarsely, you know, it's not really very important for that. Here we are. We mix that in. Cook it like a minute or so, and then we add most of the rest of our ingredient. This is that kind of omini. And this is a type of corn which is treated with lye and kind of explodes, get much larger. It's a very addictive type of taste, quite different than anything else. Tomato. We have chicken stock here. And then I have some green salsa here that I made with tomatillo. 
which is part of the berry family actually. It's part of a, a very sour type of berry. And with this, I'm going to put garlic. I have some thyme here, thyme leaves. A little bit of uh, cinnamon in this, just a dash of cinnamon. And then some cumin. And finally some garlic. And the soup is going to cook for about 10-15 minutes. You bring it to a boil, cook it 10-15 minutes, and we're going to finish it later on with cilantro at the end and some fresh corn. So the garlic again, you know, here I'm going uh, crazy with the garlic. Four or five cloves of garlic. Just coarsely chopped, you know. That's it. And this now will come to a boil. Lower the heat a little bit after it boils and simmer it 10-15 minutes. And now the main course of our dish is going to be a mixture of blackfish, a beautiful a sea bass here, black sea bass. And uh, Chinese restaurants use that a lot. It's one of the finest fish, in my opinion. This has been scaled, of course, and the, the, the skin is very, very delicate and light, so you leave the skin on. But the fish will be cooked a little later. We start first with chorizo and the potato. So I'm going to cut some chorizo into slice, and the chorizo is, of course, a Spanish sausage, which is kind of spicy. You could replace that with andouille, for example, here, or and if you doesn't, if you don't like something very spicy, we can go with a calbesa. I am going to put some oil in there, a little bit of olive oil, my chorizo. Here it is and potato. I have two potatoes there which are peeled ahead as you can see and you can do that ahead providing you keep them in water. If you don't keep them in water they will tend to discolor which actually doesn't really make that much difference for that because even if they discolor after that you won't see it by the time they are cooked. If you want to peel your potato cut a place so that you're on top of it. Cut a face if you want so that it doesn't rolling under your finger, that can be dangerous. And I'll put that to cook, that's going to cook about 7-8 minutes. That's it, I have plenty of potato there. And with that dish we're going to do mussel. And uh, the mussel I'm going to cook with wine and water. Put that a little bit here. Look at your muscle and make sure that they're all closed. It used to be that uh, I would press them on the side to try to make them open because they would be full of mud. That did happen. I used to pick up my muscle in Connecticut. Now they are grown and the one grown on wire and usually there is no sand in there so it's quite nice. However, you still look if there is any piece of beard to remove it and particularly if they are open. I don't see any open here. Uh, then you kind of discard it or what happened if that muscle is open I bang it if it closes it because it's live just happened for here so we're going to put that directly into a skillet with some white wine a little bit of water and that will open in about three four minutes then what we'll do is to take the shell uh, at least one of the shell and keep the one with the meat in it, strain the juice and we'll add that to our chorizo later on. They are doing fine now. There we go. That piece fell on the stove, so don't put it back in it. Eat it. I love chorizo, it's very spicy. This is doing well. Oh, and the mussels are now cooked. You can see that they are totally open. So what you want to do is to cool them up a little bit before you open them. You know, or you can open them this way. And we put them 
on the side like this. You know, the muscle that we get in France are the called the Molle de Bouchot, you know, and they are kind of yellow inside and very full. And we used to have that type of muscle in Connecticut years ago. When I first moved to Connecticut, close to 30 years ago, I used to go muscling. There was a place, I mean, like the bottom of the, the river there, which came out an outlet, an inlet of the sea. And the whole bottom was covered with muscle. And we used to get a lot of those. Uh, the muscle can eat also be eaten raw. You know, and raw they are quite good. Usually around Toulon in the south of France, they give you raw muscle and they are very red inside, very iodine. And you know, you clean up all of your muscle. This way that can be done ahead, for those shells you don't need it. And you have to be careful at that point, you know, to pour out the juice here. And you don't have to filter it through. All you have to do is to let it rest for a second and pour it gently, you know. And you will see, you said that at the end of it, there is a certain amount of sand and dirt or whatever, so don't pour the end of it. That's it. Now the mussel are going to go right in there to be mixed and served with the fish and with the juice here. But there is another dish that I wanted to show you. My mother used to do all the time since I have open mussel here. When I was a kid, this is much less expensive actually than the clam, you know, or actually oyster that often that dish is made with. And you just open your mussel as I did here, put them on the first course like this in a little gratin dish, and then we put kind of a snail butter, you know, with it, or olive oil, you know, it's done with it. Uh, I put pepper on it, you know, then a little bit of garlic. Chop the garlic, you chop a bit of parsley with it, and that mixture of parsley and garlic is called persillade in France. Persil is parsley and ail is garlic. So persillade, which is one word, is that mixture of garlic and parsley. This is certainly the signature of cooking at home, you know. Even in small restaurants, my mother will do Tomato, she saute tomato, she put persillade at the end. She saute potato, put persillade. Saute a piece of fish, persillade at the end. Saute a steak, persillade at the end. We eat a lot of persillade here. So this, you can mix that with butter, or actually even with olive oil. Perfectly fine. Here I have it here. Olive oil, maybe, right in there. Dash of salt in this. And we want to put bread on top. But first, you put that into your muscle. This is a great dish that can be done ahead. You know, in a small restaurant, people would do that. Have it ready to pop it under the, in the hot oven. You have your six muscle. You charge $8.95 for it, you're making really good. Yeah. A bit of bread, I don't need much, a little bit of fresh bread crumb always we put on top here so I can do it by hand. Put on top. You know what you do when you use bread crumb on top of something like that? It's always nice to moisten it with a dash of oil. And the reason is that otherwise it will tend to burn. When there is some oil on top of it, then not enough to make it gooey, but just enough to moisten it like this. And that's fine, you know, you would put that on top. You have enough here for two or three. And I guess just before I put it into the oven, I would put a dash of white wine on top of this, you know. That's a great dish, easy to do. But with our fish, 
for our chorizo here. We're going to now cook the fish with that. And I can put that in the oven also. So very simply, this we're going to put it directly under the broiler and cooking it only one side, skin side up. And that will cook in a couple of minutes, you know. So what I do is to put salt and pepper on this. Here we are. You can score the skin of the fish, you know. Sometimes the scoring I can do one or two. You will see it makes it up and, and it looks good and it cooks a little faster. Okay. Oil it again. Put oil in my finger because you really want very little here. There we are. And that should go under the broiler for a couple of minutes. I'll put that in the oven and I'll put this one also. here and this one I'm going to put on the side here and it shouldn't take more than two or three minutes to cook it during that time the potato here are cooked chorizo are more than cooked they are practically burned but they are good this way I put my, the mussel in there and the juice of the mussel which has been, as you know, filtered. Okay, all of that coming to a boil and that's it. This is ready. And now let's check the soup to see where we're at here. Hmm. Soup has been boiling nicely here. I think we're ready to continue with the soup. And it's very easy. All we have to do at the end is corn and have fresh corn here. Very often people try to cut corn and move this way. And as you can see, the knife is hard and kind of dangerous to come this way. And all of it, the question of position of the knife. You see from that position here, you move here. And you start here and you finish there. And all of a sudden, everything becomes very easy to cut. Because you're using the knife properly, cutting rather than <coughs> crutching forward. Now you can do it the other way if you're a bit afraid. But basically you go, you move forward. That is, you don't crush it down. You go from here to there. From here to there, you know. Here is the cone can even clean up that part of it. The corn, you know, for me, just come to a boil and it's enough. So here we are. I'm going to put the cilantro in it. All of that can go together to finish the soup. Okay, it's basically come back to a boil or even if it stay in that hot liquid, it's enough to cook the corn. In summer, that's how I cook my corn. I put them in boiling water, let them come back to a boil, shut it off and leave them there. Here we have a nice bowl of chowder here. That with a piece of cornbread, it's a whole meal in itself. Now let me check on the fish. That's cooked. This is almost cooked under the broiler. You can see that this is curled up nicely. It's a fresh fish. And that would be ready to be served. But I don't want to leave that too long under the broiler. I'm going to check it again because... 
Yeah, it's going to be ready. Could be a bit browner than that, but that's beautiful. And if I leave it longer, I'm going to burn it. So here it is. Nice dish. Remind me of my youth. And now with this, I'm going to serve the, the potato and the mussel. Okay, and you serve right, a piece of fish right in the center of it. A little bit of parsley on top. Maybe just the leaf of parsley is fine like this. This is it. I can't wait to taste that one here. I know this is hot, very hot. And uh, I'm gonna taste it anyway. Mm, it's pretty good. Really, really good. How about that good muscle? And with that, of course, I cook the chorizo with this. And I put it on top of the, my muscle also. So, a Sancerre, one of my favorite wines. This is a, a wine from the Loire Valley in France. It's actually a Sauvignon Blanc, but it's very grassy too. And this is goes very well with it. And as I'm testing that, I realize that I have garlic and onion here. This was supposed to go into my... But this is what the cooking is all about. Variation. One day you put it in, one day you forget it. And sometimes you discover a new recipe. Anyway. I'm going to do a very simple dessert with banana. I just get, cut that lime in half. And you can see that I'm pressing pressing, pressing, and nothing is happening. So look at that. So sometimes there is no juice in those things. What you do, you put them in the microwave oven and or in boiling water, like 10, 15 seconds, or then you roll it like that, just to crack the texture, the fiber inside. One way or third, you can see this one was cut across. If you cut them without really touching the center of the pit here, and this one was in the microwave and was about 20 seconds. I mean, look at that. I have a lot of juice in this one. That's great. I'm very proud of myself on that one. So more juice. We developed that recipe last winter when I was skiing with Jean-Claude, a smuggler on Notch near Stowe. And at night we do drink a lot of wine and we had no dessert, we had guests coming, but we had banana because we always have to have banana. Claude loves banana. So uh, I said, well, we have banana. I had some honey and we had some bourbon. So we just mix it together and add our banana and bourbon. That was very good. So I decided to do a little recipe in remembrance of that desking, you know? So here I have a mixture of lime juice, honey, and bourbon. If you don't want to do any dessert, just bring this, that's fine. But now we put our banana to marinate in this, or macerate, you know, here it is. And the beauty of it, of course, is that if you do it this way, since there is acidity in there, it's not going to discolor. If you were to uh, leave those banana outside, of course, they will, they will discolor. If you slide your finger as you go down, each time you go against your finger and get about the same slice, banana. Okay, I have two banana here, probably enough, but put another one. There is plenty variation like that that you can do with fruit. And for me, it's always the best dessert, you know? So, so in our recipe that night, all we did actually was to take some cookie. We had cookie with our beautiful butter cookie. Break them into a nice bowl. I don't think we had a bowl quite as nice as that one, but... And then fill it up. The juice will go to the bottom and absorb with the cookie. And that's basically it, you know. You would want to 
if you want, put some sliced salmon on top of it, give it a bit of crunch. And even a little piece of uh, those twill of the, you know, with that little mash in here, that's good. And that's a nice dessert, very simple. Now you want to do a variation, very easy. Take the same cookie or another cookie in the bottom. Slightly richer, we put a bit of sour cream here or creme fraiche, whatever is hanging around. More cookie. No, no, more banana. Should I put the banana first? Doesn't matter really. You can put that with ice cream too. It's really good with ice cream. So we put this. The juice, the juice is the best, of course. Maybe we have enough cookie, maybe a couple more cookie. A bit of sour cream extra. Another couple of banana slice on top of it. Now to be a bit different, I have some pistachio here. You can put the pistachio right on top or you can crush them if you want. Put your pistachio right there. That's another dessert. Very easy to do. Go skiing with your friend, drink some wine, do simple dessert and enjoy life. Happy cooking. A KQED television production. A fast easy dessert that the kid love to eat and love to make is graham cracker, a nice scoop of ricotta on top, some dry fruit like apricot and raisins, and then you can put some honey on top of it. All around, the kid will love it. I am Jacques Pepin. This is Fast Food My Way. Happy cooking. Today I'm going to do a lamb stew with beans and a very easy way of doing it. The first thing that I'm doing here, I'm cleaning up a leek to put it in there. And as you can see, it's not a question of taking a leek and often those cost like a dollar a piece, you know, and cutting the whole thing there. No, you cut them so to keep a little bit of the green there. And then you open it in half or in two or three pieces. And you can see that this is where you will have all of the dirt right there in between the leaves and so forth. So you wash it now under running water. So here, open it like this to be sure that you go between your leaves. That's it. Okay, so the light green, you know, is the part that you want. And this, frankly, I don't throw it out. I throw that part out. But this usually I freeze it. I wash it, freeze it, and when I do stock, I use that in the stock. So I clean up my table, if there is any dirt. And I'm probably going to use about Oh, about a cup, cup and a half of, uh, of the leek here, so that should be enough. That stew is going to be done in the pressure cooker, which I have right here. And it's very easy to do it. I'm using la uh, lamb, I mean shoulder lamb. You can see here, uh, there is that bone, we see the shoulder blade. Those are really nice and tender. And those come directly like that from the supermarket. You can remove a little bit of the fat if you want. Remember that in the lamb, 
in the mutton or in the lamb, the strong taste is always in the fat. Now I put that directly in the pressure cooker. Beans, just wash those beans here, I have half a pound of beans. White beans, great northern beans, pea beans, navy beans, all of those white beans, any of those is going to work perfectly fine. I'm going to put the leek in there. Okay. Three cup or four cup of water. I have close to. Yeah, three cup of water is enough. Two cup of tomato. This is regular diced canned tomato. I'm putting about a teaspoon and a half of salt. See, you have to put all your stuff in it because by the time you start cooking, you cannot open it and start all over again. Herbe de Provence or Italian seasoning or fresh thyme, bay leaf that you have out of your garden, onion and garlic. And that's basically it for the pressure cooker to start. Now the stew like this, the beans certainly, are going to take from an hour to an hour and a half, sometimes two hours to cook. In the pressure cooker, in 30 minutes, I'll have a perfect stew. My sister-in-law in France, I remember very well when my brother lived in Paris, she used to uh, work uh, in Paris also, and at night she would finish work, she'd take the train at the, the Gare Saint-Lazare, you know, in Paris, and uh, get home. And I'm going to put a little bit of worst, worst your sauce in it. Worst your sauce, that's a hard word to say for me. In any case, she would come out of the train, she would pick up her bread, she would pick up everything, a little roast of veal, anything like that, get home. Before even she take her coat off, she put her pressure cooker with a roast of veal, start browning it, closing it, go to take her clothes off, prepare the aperitif or take a shower, and that was it. She was ready within 30 minutes. Now what happened is that here, the pressure cooker, the pressure inside has to go up to there is those little line here those red lines that you have. You have one line, two line, three line. It should come to the third line because of the pressure. And it will take about 10, 12 minutes to do that. At that point, you start timing about 30 minutes and it's fine. And the way it works is that you use those particularly when you are at high elevation. You know, when you work at sea level, usually the pressure is such like 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees centigrade, the pressure cracks the water and it starts boiling. As you go higher, every, uh, I think it's every 500 feet, you lose one, one degree, I think it is, something like that. So like in Aspen, Colorado, 8,200 feet, it's like 16 degrees less to boil. To instead of boiling at 212, the water boiled at like 195. At some point, you cook certain things where the cellulose in it is so strong that it doesn't, it doesn't cook, and it boils hours and hours and hours. I've boiled black beans, for example, in Aspen, and never get them really cooked. So at that point, you use a pressure cooker there because it does the opposite. It applies pressure on top of the liquid. By the time it starts boiling in there, it's over 300 degrees in terms of pressure. So it breaks down the cellulose and the texture in meat and cook very, very fast. That's the principle of the pressure cooker, you know? So we'll lower it by the time it gets to the red mark. And now I'm going to do lobster, a lobster salad with a special bonus. What I have here, I have uh, lobster which are cooked. I cover them with water, like four cups of water, bring them to a strong boil with the water just from the tap, you know. Bring them to a boil, simmer it gently five minutes, take it off the heat and leave them 30 minutes in that water to continue cooking. This is approximately two pound lobster. Now you can break the tail. I already clean one here. Bring the two claw. Take the center out. And here I have the juice that I have from the other lobster plus the juice that it cooked in. So all of that stuff I'm going to put in. This is the tamale here that I have. This will going to go inside. The body of the lobster has a lot of taste. And this I'm going to cut into pieces like I have it here to make a special soup, to make a bisque of lobster with that. The tail, you crack the tail this way and then start breaking out to remove this. Then you continue breaking it, a second joint maybe, and then after it should slide out. 
you know. Here is, so I have a nice. This is winter lobster, very hard to when they are very fleshy inside. Yes. And now we're gonna break this. So you break them at the joint here. Break them at the joint here. You see you have two claws, the crusher and the pincher. You wanna take this and break it gently here and pull out, see that piece of cartilage pull out inside. This is part of this. What I have here, you use the bottom of a pan or something to crack it, put your towel on top of it so you don't mess up the table too much. And then your tail should come out with this. See, you have the whole claw of the lobster without that little piece inside, which is that piece which is right in the center here that you have to remove. And now I have those that I crush. That piece here, that nut which I have here, that particular articulation here, this is the best part of the lobster. According to the great lobster aficionado. And Julia told me also that it was the best part of the lobster, so Julia told me I believe her. Here it is. And there is a little piece still in there that you can break or cut with a knife. Surely this. You open it with a knife. Always watch out because you can always kind of uh, puncture your finger a little bit. But this is the joy of eating lobster in the summer, you know, cutting your finger with it. Okay. And that's it. We have all of our meat out of the lobster except the meat that you will have in the tiny leg around the body. If I go eating lobster with my wife, she's going to take everything there is in those legs. And we're gonna stay at the table for three hours. I mean, she's going to roll this, you know, if you roll this, you can see the meat will eventually, you know, start coming out here. I'm not that patient, you know, so I'll do a soup with it. And we're going to do a lobster bisque, which is really, really good. So I have lobster. The part of the body that's really where you have a lot of taste are going to be in there. And I want to brown that at high temperature, cook it for about eight, 10 minutes to really get crystallization of the shell on top and it give a lot of taste. Huh? And when it's nice and brown, then I will continue putting all of my vegetable in it. So for the time being, I leave it like this. I had two lobster here, about two pound lobster, four pound of lobster. I should have a good pound of meat, pound, pound and a quarter. When a lobster is really good, it gives you one to four. That is a pound lobster, give you four ounces of meat. And you know, this is important because certain type of fish, like for example, a sole, the, the English sole, you know, the dove sole. One pound sole gives you about three ounces of meat totally clean. A salmon, for example, is about 50%. 10 pounds salmon give you five pounds of meat. When you go to calamari or a scallop, then you get much more even. So here, that's what I do here, is just to cut those into pieces. And they are not overcooked, they are great. Meat is splendid here. Oop. When you open it like that, you can see this one, get the black. The black that, this is the intestinal tract, you know, black like that, and of course you should remove that. This is strong. Okay, nothing funny on my plate. So I can put back my lobster here. And now do the sauce for it. We're going to do a kind of cream sauce. Keep cleaning as you come along. And maybe I'll check my lobster out here. Yeah, it's browning nicely. That's what I want. I want to keep browning it. So I keep it uncovered. And here is the sauce, a very simple but very delicious sauce. I'm trying to duplicate crème fraîche we have in France, you know. The cream that we get off the milk in France and which is very high, usually in butter fat, but really good. So I use regular heavy cream here which is about 35% uh, butter fat. 
whip it a little bit, not much, you know, maybe 15 seconds. That almost double it in, uh, you know, in proportion. And now it's nice and creamy. I'm going to use a bit of sour cream to it, which is about 15% butter fat, much less, but we'll thicken it. And the taste, somehow the taste of the two cream together, probably because of the sourness in this, you see it will thicken. Huh? And it be, in my opinion, quite close to the cream that we have in France. So with that, I'm going to put pepper, lemon, I will strain that through and that's it and my lobster okay that lobster is now ready to be served mm. I can't wait I have to test it uh, I was good thing I tested it because I need salt in there. Always taste salt, a dash more pepper, and I'm going to put a little bit of tarragon, tarragon in there. I think my lobster is jumping all over the place here. You can see the crystallization in the bottom of the pan and the smell it has a very when the shell start browning like that a very specific smell and that's what i want let it a few more seconds tarragon in spring i have a lot of tarragon in my garden you know if you have the right place for it the tarragon loves the place where you put it it comes back every year bigger and bigger my plant is probably i don't know 20 years old or so now even in Connecticut. Now, I think I can hear my pressure cooker here. You can hear it sizzling. If there is extra pressure, it will sizzle. And this went to the third thing, so this is fine. At that point, I can time it for 20, 30 minutes. Leave it right there. Okay, tarragon. See the way the pressure cooker hisses, you know. It hisses when the pressure is too much, so there is a way of relieving it. That's why those are quite safe to use. As soon as I lower the heat a lot, it really sees, then the noise goes. And then you time it. Okay. Now this is time. I love, I love this also with Boston lettuce, and I have some beautiful Boston lettuce here, some leaves that I clean up. I want to put them there. And uh, my lobster here. I mean, you want to give a good portion, but it's expensive stuff, huh? I don't want to go too far. And that's going to be great with a dry white wine. I want to continue with this. As you can see now, there is no more moisture and it's really browning. So what I want to do is to put the vegetable in it. I have thyme, bay leaf, celery, you know, garlic, onion, a little bit of uh, cayenne, you know, which is a hot pepper, so not too much of it. A bit of tomato paste. and the stock of the lobster you, know. you can saute that a few minutes if you want it's fine i think that i'm going to put my stock right away a little bit of white wine first i have to taste it just in case something happened you never know i don't want to ruin my dish 
I think that's fine. It won't ruin the 